One of the big factors in the problems that universities are facing is the, the fall in the number of Chinese students, Nigerian students, and then above all, because of the debate on immigration, the Sunak government stopping master students from bringing family members to the UK because a lot of overseas students, they come here. Welcome to the Rest is Politics Question Time with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. And Rory, quite a few questions this week on the premise that you might have won the leadership contest in 2019, which I'm sure would have made you very, very happy and would have made me very happy because it meant Boris Johnson would never have been Prime Minister. Harris and Jane, if you, Rory, had won the leadership contest in 2019, who would have been in your cabinet? Philip Davis... I don't think that's Philip Davis, the MP. Sorry, Sir Philip Davis. In a parallel universe, if Rory won the Tory leadership contest and became PM, what were your three top policy deliveries? Well, policy, more straightforward, because that was something I was actively campaigning on. And that was customs union. Then and now, I believe that the UK joining the customs union is the best way of you know, recognizing the result of the referendum while also giving Britain a close relationship with Europe economically, politically. And I think even today, if we join the customs union, could transform confidence in our economy. The second one was getting cross-party agreement on adult social care and the NHS. I mean, it seems to me like a massive looming disaster that, broadly speaking, the two parties ought to be able to agree on, and we need to put it on a 2030 year footing and fund fund it properly. And the third one, which was a bit more left field, was I was pushing for midlife education. I was very conscious that AI robotics would lead to people losing their jobs. And I still think in the next 10 years, we're going to see a massive displacement in the workforce. Mm. So having really high quality training for someone in their 30s or 40s to allow them to get another job was the other bit. Cabinet's more tricky. I mean, cabinet, obviously, I didn't talk about at the time. Um, You'll be astonished to hear I would have made David Gork my Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, (laughs) Really astonished. (laughs) Breaking news. Do you think David Gork is mentioned more than any other non- party leading or presidential or prime ministerial figure on this podcast. Yeah, it's possible that I'm actually running a a, a leadership campaign for David uh, subliminally all the time. Uh I did actually want him to run. I only ran because he wouldn't run. Um, Yeah. uh, So he's chancellor. Who's your your foreign secretary? Probably David Liddington, um, who, again, you know, left with me, but I thought was, had been an amazing foreign office minister. Very, very calm, very quiet. Highly admired. And, and your Home Secretary, and, I, and I'm, I'm, watch, I'm watching out for diversity here, or your Home yeah. Secretary? So, so you're saying the answer couldn't be Ken Clark. That was not, not, not the route to go down. <laughs> I th- I'd have put him in a just, I'd have made him justice. Just, justice. Um, well, um, I rated Victoria Prentice, who I like very much. Um, I rated Alex Chalk, Sajid Java, Jeremy Hunt. Of the Brexiteers, I probably would have put in. James Cleverly, Graham Stewart, Rishi Sunak, Nigel Adams, Mark Spencer. Um, mm. uh, it's a pretty rum lot. <laughs> <laughs> who, were you, who were you going to put in? Or is your basic view that we're all such a bunch of disasters you can't come up with a single one? <laughs> <laughs> I'd, have, I'd have struggled. I noticed I didn't hear the name Gove in there. Well, my, Michael Gove is um, was... Controversial education secretary, he was very good actually in environment, very good in justice. And there's a reason why he's in everybody's cabinet, which is he's very hardworking, very focused, very practical. So I think the temptation probably would have been to use him actually in the way that even Boris Johnson, who had real problems with him, used him um, in in a delivery department. Would you have tried to persuade Theresa May to take a step down? Well, Theresa May as foreign secretary would have been interesting, wouldn't it? That's a good idea. Yeah. Is that what you were pushing for? So Liddington's, Liddington's been sacked already? Well, I don't know. I'm just... You know, See how hard try, it is try. to do reshuffles, Rory. <laughs> it's, it's very hard. And of course, balancing the different parts of the party, because of course, what I would have done is I then would have had an enraged Boris Johnson, Pretty Patel, Liz Truss, um, all Braverman. of whom would be Braverman, all of whom would have been... Braverman, I think, uh, in 2019, luckily didn't really <laughs> exist, but or not in the same way she does now as a major political figure. Mm. But... Um, and Jacob Rees-Mogg and the rest of them would have been causing absolute ructions on the back benches. Yeah. yeah. So the question is, would yeah. you have been able to bring in more moderate, thoughtful people from the Brexit faction? You know, for example, 
Steve, Steve Baker, who I think you had a real run in with when we were in uh, Dublin together, but who Belfast. has Belfast, it was in Belfast, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, who I think, you know, has actually been quite a sort of loyal, constructive member of various governments since. Steve Baker, yeah, we met him in Belfast, didn't we, when he, he called me Satan. That's another yeah. story. That's, that's, that's not, a, not, not a great, not a great. Not a great moment. No, you're right. It's really <laughs> difficult putting these cabinets together because you're trying to get talent and you're also trying, which is my kind of David Gork, David Lettington bit, you're also trying to get big communicators and you're trying to hold different parts of the party together. And and I guess this is why uh, we look at these cabinets and we're like, whoa, how on earth do we end up with that? Yeah, they're, they're like a very, very difficult psychological jigsaw. Right, here we are. Best of the rest, Sean Rutter. You've done best and worst PMs. Who's the best prime minister we never had? Who would have made a cracking PM but didn't quite get there for whatever reason? Can you g- give us a couple of names from various parties on that? Oh, I think it's so hard to answer that question because you just don't know until they get there whether they would have been any good. Um, I think an obvious one is David Miliband. I won- I do. I still wonder. I mean, it's idle wondering it now because he didn't become leader of the Labour Party, but I wonder whether he might have beaten David Cameron. I think going back... I, I again, Tony Blair became prime minister, having become Labour leader on the back of John Smith dying. Now I think John Smith would have become prime minister and, and would probably have been a very good prime minister, very much in the kind of Atlee Starmer mould as opposed to sort of you know Blair Clinton as it were. Um, I think on on the Tory side, I actually do think Michael Heseltine would have been a pretty good prime minister. Um, again, more on the more of a sort of Blair Clinton figure than Atlee Smith Starmer. What did you make of Willie Whitelaw, who, of course, people thought was the person who was he was in in my constituency, Penrith and Border, and was the person people thought was going to beat Mrs. Thatcher? I mean, on a personal level, I liked him. Um, he he used to do these these briefings for the for journalists, and and he was he was very funny. He was very charming. I mean, you know way off the sort of posh scale in my in my kind of you know poshometer um but i thought pretty charming and pretty funny and very very clever i don't think he'd have been a good prime minister no i mean it's a difficult time to come into wasn't it late 70s whether he would have been yeah. able to actually bring through reforms um the I, i've been caught up a little bit in this whole debate around so the uh, chris patton's stepping down as the chancellor of oxford yeah and there's this big debate because they've seemed to be changing the rules to prevent uh White male politicians, politicians becoming politicians. chancellor of Oxford University. What, exactly. Um, but the last two, Chris Patton and Roy Jenkins, um, are interesting characters. Do you think either of them? Yeah. I mean, it, it, so it sort of became a role for people who, uh, Oxford graduates at least, rather kind of fantasized about becoming prime minister, but, <laughs> but didn't, didn't ever make it. Yeah. You see, again, those, those two are classic. Of the, of, when I said earlier, you, you wouldn't really know until they got there. Both very, very significant political figures, um, both with a track record of making real change. I think, I mean, Roy, you know, some of the greatest things that past Labour governments did, it was Roy Jenkins who had them on his, on his agenda. Um, again, whether they had what it takes for the very, very top job, I'm not sure. I remember with Chris Patton, when there was a lot of talk that he might uh, become prime minister or certainly become conservative leader either before or after John Major did. I remember a big part of the debate was was about the fact that he was a he was a Catholic right. and, he, and how difficult it would be for a Catholic. And now, without any sense of it being a problem at all, we have a Hindu right, prime right, minister. Right. So that that shows it's a big just change, how much very things quickly, have changed. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think both listen, both of them very very significant. And I have to say, Chris Patton did an interview the other day on LBC about Brexit, which was absolutely brilliant. Um, he really called it out for what it is. So, yeah, both of them very, very, very uh, big political figures. But I just think you don't know until they get there whether and, they can would do you, it. Would you, would you just very quickly, what do you, given that my name's in, in the running for this, forget me, but what, what do you think about this idea that instead of having a full democracy, which is what they used to have, where all the graduates from Oxford were allowed to vote and choose whoever they wanted, They've now set up a sort of secretive appointed committee that reduces the number of candidates, presumably because they basically don't trust the electorate. They think Oxford graduates can't be trusted to produce a sensible chancellor. Mm. I can't pretend to know what the what the chancellor does and what sort of powers and functions they have, but I think it. You are slight. I mean, the, the fact that somebody is a politician should not, in my view, 
exclude them from running for what's clearly an important position within the university. Um, I can see why they might want to think more broadly than getting a politician. But, you know, has, did Chris Patton do a pretty good job? Most people would say yes. Did Roy Jenkins do a pretty good job? I think most people would say yes. So I think it's a very, very odd move. And I think it's just part of this whole sort of let's let's just be horrible about politicians all the time, which when you were meant to be one of the great seats of learning in the world, I'm not sure that's a very good message to send out. Right. Talking of universities, Rory, more than 40 UK universities have announced cuts and redundancies. 63% of higher education institutions in England and Wales could be in deficit by 25, 26. How has the collapse of a sector worth 130 billion to the economy been allowed to happen? And what can any government do now? Ooh, and then Mark Smith on the same one. Is it time to cut universities loose from the fees cap? Well, I guess this is all about where the universities get their incomes, how much they get directly from the government and taxpayers, how much they get from people paying tuition fees and getting student loans, how much money they get from foreign students who mm -hmm. I think are able to pay more. And this was a huge issue, wasn't it? Tuition fees all the way through because there was an argument out there that given that graduates tend to earn more, it was unfair that taxpayers in general should pay for something that graduates were benefiting from. So there was this move to introduce tuition fees. I think it started under you guys, under Labour, mm -hmm. and then it was mm -hmm. increased significantly by the Tory Liberal Coalition government, which was a big, big problem for the Lib Dems because they'd campaigned against tuition fees. Um, mm -hmm. What do you remember about that whole debate? That it was very, very difficult. And one of our, look, we, what was our, one of our most famous slogans, ask me my three priorities for government, and I tell you, education, education, education. So one of our big goals was to huge, a huge increase in the number of, uh, of school leavers who went to university. Um, so that we wanted a big expansion of the university sector, both because of the commitment to our own education, but also, as the questioner Chris Smith said, because of the role that universities play. And is this the these Chris, Chris Smith? Is it your? I friend, don't know Chris if Smith? it is because yeah, no. I don't know because. But if it is, then Chris Smith is now um, he's the master of an Oxford college. But I, I think if it was the Chris Smith or that Chris Smith, I think he would have probably said so. But it might be. Um, uh, I know he listens to the podcast, so he can he can let us know. Um, but what's so so that, so we brought it in quite difficult, quite controversial, but I think people you know more or less understood. I think we managed to explain the reasons that you couldn't you know when I went to university, I had a, a full grant, and you know it was it, it wasn't even on the radar that we might end up having to sort of pay these sorts of fees. Obviously, Nick Clegg massively damaging to him politically that he became part of the coalition and they went went along with this increase but the, but this in answer to Chris Smith's question. It, got, it, it underlines yet again just how interconnected we all are because one of the big factors in the problems that universities are facing is the, the fall in the number of Chinese students because of sort of political difficulties. And of course, that's exacerbated by some recent developments. Uh, Nigerian students who at one point were the fastest growing group in British universities, that has almost collapsed because there's been a, a collapse in the value of uh, Nigerian currency and then above all because of the debate on immigration the sunak government stopping master students from bringing family members to the uk because a lot of overseas students they come here for postgraduate courses they may be into their mid-20s and older they've got kids they've got wives so all of these things have come together to to hit the uh, the number of students coming from abroad and because and then you add in the scottish um the Scottish angle where university fees for Scots are, fr are free, uh, so they need more overseas students. In inflation, I reckon, because I think um, by law, tuition fees were capped at £9,250 10 years ago. And I reckon £9,000 10 years ago is about £12,000 today. So there's been a huge yeah. increase in the costs for the universities in inflation, but tuition fees have been capped. And of course, it's much, much higher than it is in somewhere like Spain, where I think tuition fees are like a £1,000 a year or even less. Um, yeah. But we've still got this amazing, amazing sector. I mean, we've got this incredible universities. I mean, we, we're, I think, yeah. 17 of the top 100 in the world are British universities. I mean, they, we still, it's one of the few things Britain does do better on than other European countries. We've got many more yeah. in the top 100 than France. But we're seeing at the moment, so last week, I think it was Essex that announced that they were facing real financial difficulties. It's happening a little bit piecemeal at the moment, and I'm not aware of a kind of government strategy to address this. And I worry 
that it's one of the many, the growing list of areas that the government is thinking too hot to handle pre-election, let's leave it. And if Labour win, they're going to have to pick this up. But if universities start to go bust, that is going to be incredibly damaging. Uh, the and the, there is also another thing which I think people have pointed out, which is, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sure this is a bad egg problem. It's not definition of the sector, but unfortunately there have been institutions which have just been relying on income from foreign students and mm not producing a really great level of education. And the implication is that students are signing up to these courses, partly to be able to come to the UK, not getting a great deal of education out of it. So th there's, a, there's, a, there's a real problem, which is this is a huge sector with a lot of income coming in, but people being a bit worried that, at least on the fringes, there are some pretty dodgy universities who are not really providing very good education and are getting people who mm. aren't really committed to education as, as a way mm. of coming into of course the other the other factor that, that that has played a part in this is our old friend austerity i mean there has been a, there have been cuts to funding for teaching really substantial uh, inflation as you say is a is, is a big part of it as well and and some pretty you know we're not talking you know that some of the universities that we're talking about they're you know they're pretty big names within the university sector that are reporting real difficulties in 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 pay in hiring and you talked about the the uh, as you say we are i think we're second only to america in in terms of how many universities we've got in the top 100 in the world and in 2012 britain british universities accounted for 15 percent of the most cited research papers in the world and that's now fallen to just above 10 percent now there could be all sorts of other factors there rise of china and so forth but i think that we we underestimate how much good our universities do, not just in education, but also in the economy and our, and our soft power as well, our global standing. It's incredibly important. Yeah, and, and really good for, well, for, for almost everything we care about. I mean, to return to our Anthony Gormley interview on leading, for just encouraging us to think critically, live well, have fulfilling lives. Someone called Kennebot coming in with a question here. In Australia, you've just come back from Australia, we're seeing an enormous surge in former NHS staff migrating here for economic reasons. They can get mm. paid double or sometimes triple here what they get in the NHS, and yet our healthcare is largely affordable and high quality. Can Britain learn lessons from us? I mean, I'm sure we can learn a lot of lessons, but I hope what Kennebot doesn't mean is that we should be paying three times as much um, because... Wage bills are already thirty-seven percent of the NHS budget, so that's not a mm. that would not. I mean, if we tripled the salaries of people in the NHS, it would mean the overall. Well, obviously, ninety-five percent of the current NHS budget would just be salaries, and it would effectively double the size of the budget. Yeah, you mentioned the fact that I was there recently, and I, I met um, I met both doctors and nurses randomly. Um, who were Brits, who were out there, who'd gone out there. And they w they didn't say they were tripling their, their salaries at all. They said they, they were improving their salaries. Um, but actually, they said there were other factors that they felt were, were more important. And the one that, that, that was most cited was the fact that they felt they were valued and respected. Um, I think I told you before, there was one guy who'd worked in a, in a hospital in Surrey who said, it's just so nice going to work and nobody abuses or insults you. Um, I think, and particularly, you, you, you know, I, I was in um, the Royal Free recently, just in, in A and E, um, and visiting somebody, and the, the the signs all over the place. You know, abuse will not be tolerated. Our staff are entitled to respect, and this is all because they are. It's just becoming part of the furniture now, working inside the NHS that. You're going to get shouted at because people are waiting too long. Uh, there isn't the bed that you need, and so forth. So, I think it is that. I think it's the sense of respect, and 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 so I, I don't think it's just about money. I mean, yes, listen. The other thing, let's be absolutely frank about it: the weather, um, the lifestyle. That's the other thing they said. It's just so nice to be able to leave work and you know go go have to you the ever beach. Been, have or... you ever been tempted by Australia as a place to live? I mean, it's, it, it seems to be. You oh, seem yeah, to have a lot of fondness for it, don't you? I do. I, 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 I would be tempted. I mean, look, I, I, I actually said to my kids, I said, you know, if I was your age, I'd, I'd love to live in Australia. Um, I think it's, I think it's just got the feel of a young dynamic country. Now it's got problems. And I think the whole Aboriginal issue is really, really quite profoundly depressing. 
I think its politics is quite interesting. I've just read a brilliant book, by the way, Roy. You would love it. Um, it's 20-odd years old now, but it was given to me out there. And it's a book by Paul Keating's speechwriter called Recollections <laughs> of a Broken Heart. And it's right. absolutely, it's the closest, it's the best book I think I've come across for describing what it's like inside a high level political organization with all the ups and the downs and the characters and the egos and, and all that. So yeah, I do like Australia, but no, I, I, I think if I was, if I was going to leave England, it would be to live in either Scotland or France, I think. Great. Now um, here's one, Rory, yeah. also a health question, Helen Cooper, how about a sugar tax entirely to be used to help fund the NHS? Well, what do you, what do you think about um, yeah, I'm quite, I th well, I, I think that one of the reasons why the health service is struggling today is because of obesity uh, and because of an obesity which is caused by bad diet, lack of exercise and so forth. And a lot of that related to poverty. Um, and, and so you've got to be careful on the one hand, would the sugar tax punish those who are already pretty poor. But on the other hand, if you could hypothecate it, have the sugar tax and say that is money going direct to the National Health Service as part of a more preventive approach, I wouldn't have a problem with that. Uh, but of course, the, the food and drink industry has such powerful lobbying. Yeah, well, we did actually 20, this was a conservative thing that we did. And it's an interesting thing, because actually, to, to be frank, I'd forgotten that in 2017, I actually voted for sugar tax, and we introduced the sugar tax. It's an <laughs> interesting thing, because but you what know, happened you and I to it, though? Did it happen? No, yeah, it happened, and it's still going. But you, you, but I, I'm, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to call you out here. So it's no levy on soft <laughs> drinks less than five grams of sugar per hundred milliliters, eighteen pence per liter, of soft drinks containing between five and eight grams. But the reason I'm sort of pointing to it's not to point to you or I not knowing it. it. It's that it's an example of something that governments do, which are quite sensible, but which get not that much coverage unless you're really concentrating on it. So you or I, or a general member of the public can barely be aware that the sugar tax exists. Now, one of the things, the sugar tax at the moment is just a general tax. It just goes to, to the government. So maybe hypothecating it for the NHS might be interesting. The government did it thinking that they could reduce sugar intake by 25%. I don't think they've, or sorry, 20% by 2020. They totally failed to do that. So I think there are, there are questions about whether it really works as a, a kind of policy lever. I'd love us someday to, to debate this amazing new drug that's come in an issue for diabetes, but called, I think, Zentech, yeah. which leads to this incredible weight loss, which may turn out more than almost anything else to transform public health in a lot mm. of our countries. We can get costs down on the drug. Mm. I'm re I, I've, I've done what you normally do, Rory. I've, I've had a quick hit on Google. BBC coverage of George Osborne announcement. Mr. Osborne said the money raised, an estimated £520 million a year, will be spent on increasing the funding for sport in primary schools. Well, I haven't seen much evidence of that, I must say. Um, the, just, you talked about there about the, the difference that, um, that things can make that aren't necessarily the obvious things on healthcare. Um, it's the 20th anniversary of the smoking ban in public places in Ireland. Uh, and I would argue that, which has now been followed in 70-odd other countries, I suspect that has made, saved more lives around the world than a lot of the more high-profile, expensive changes that we've made to healthcare. Now, here's, here's, a, here's a question for you, Alistair, which I think, you know, we, we maybe do more detail next thing, but this is our year of elections, but we didn't cover properly one of the most exciting elections recently, which is the Turkish local elections. So mm -hmm. ju just a quick explainer, um, the CHP, which was the opposition party, had a very disappointing performance against Erdogan, the president, who's had this increasingly authoritarian rule and, you know, building 400 million pound mansions and locking up journalists and this, that, and the other. Last year, despite all the fallout from the earthquake, despite some catastrophic economic policies, but has had an amazing renaissance in these local elections. And these are serious stuff. When we talk local elections, we tend to think about little district councils in Cumbria. This is the directly elected mayor of Istanbul, Ankara, with huge powers. And basically, Erdogan has lost every single one of the major cities. It's a crippling blow to him because he was the mayor of Istanbul. He really lent into this campaign. It's how he made his name. He thought he could take mm. it back. And this may mean that he's what people are worried about, which is he's going to muck around with the constitution so that he can run again in 2028. 
he's now in a weaker position than he was. No, it is, it, it, I enjoyed your that little comparison between these elections in Istanbul and a local election up in Cumbria. If, if you see some of the TV pictures, I mean, these massive rallies and hundreds of thousands of people turning out. And it does seem, I mean, Erdogan had um, a candidate running for his party that was very much his man. A lot of the billboards and the posters and the advertising were the two of them together. He projected it very much as, you know, a vote for him as a vote for me. Uh, and Ekrem Imamoglu, who is the incumbent and an opposition figure, this has enormously strengthened him because he is now seen as the guy who might actually take on Erdogan and knock him out. Um, so I, th I think the, um, the result was way, way bigger than anybody seemed to expect. And I think it is a, a pretty, as you say, a pretty severe blow to Erdogan. Alan Salazar. I'm an American fan of the podcast. Thank you, Alan. And we're going to be doing more and more international stuff. So I'd like to build our American base. Comparing dysfunction, polarization, and the rise of populist stroke authoritarian tendencies, I think US politics may be far more toxic than the UK, where Brexit and Boris Johnson notwithstanding, democracy seems to be more stable, right or wrong? I think it probably is worse there. Um, I Look, I could be wrong about this. Johnson was an awful aberration. Trust was an awful aberration. But I don't think that the British would ever have them back. Whereas Trump has so managed to polarise the debate in the United States that he's now, you know, a serious, credible contender to come back despite all the lies, all the corruption, all the damage that he did to America's standing in the world. And I think a lot of this is, is about this polarization, which means that it's not just that people who are not a Democrat say, I don't like Joe Biden, I prefer Donald Trump. It's just that anything Biden says or does is bad, and anything that Trump says or does is good. And I'm a pretty tribal person, but even I do not go that far in terms of, you know, everything Labour says is good, everything the Tories say is bad. And I think the other thing that's happened in in, in American politics, is, which is why we've got to be very, very careful about the way our media landscape develops. I'm not convinced that Trump could have become president without the way, without social media, and without Fox News. Um, and I certainly, do, I think, and, and, and what's, what's interesting is how, even though the media landscape, I would argue, is less favorable to him now than it was, I think he's managed to infect enough people with the sense that whatever he says is right, that he's still in the game. Now, as it happens, I don't think he's going to win. That's famous last words, but I'm kind of with Scaramucci on that. I don't think Trump ultimately will win. I hope I'm right. I know you um, you are maybe a little bit more less confident than I am. Um, but I, I think we're, I think America is, uh, the politics there is worse than ours. Question from Amy. Um books to recommend which is something we we haven't done recently um i've just on this i just American... i just did it five yeah. minutes ago books what was your book yeah i just talked about an australian book five minutes ago oh you're what australian you about? We book. Don't do i'm it. sorry but it wasn't a question <laughs> on books you just you just you just leveraged in okay. this book on okay australia. okay so we got okay. your book okay. let me let me okay. do my books then I, I won't given you've done your book um i've been reading two amazing american coming of age narratives um donna tart's book goldfinch so she's famous because she wrote a book yep. called Secret History, people have heard of, yep. which is... Fiona's read that one. I, I thought just wonderful account of a young man moving from New York to Vegas. And and the other one, uh, which is Barbara Kringsolver's Demon Copperhead, both of them, interestingly, about young orphan men. Uh, and a lot of them engaged with, um, in, in particularly Demon Copperhead, it's about uh, these communities in parts of the United States, the old coal country along the Appalachians where, you know, he's living with this, this kind of hillbilly reputation and the total devastation of communities by opiates. And that makes it sound a bit depressing, but actually both books are kind of rather wonderful accounts written by women of young men navigating their way through life without stable parents. And I, I, I've mm. just, and they're funny and they're beautifully observed and they're incredible portraits of the, of the United States. Good. Well, sticking with books, Arena, inspired by Alistair's book, she says, I recently canvassed for the Labour candidate in Peterborough, engaging with voters on various issues. 
I'd love to hear from both of you about your personal experiences with canvassing and voters. Could you offer advice to young volunteers like myself? Oh, can uh, I, I, can I remember? Could, yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, go on. Well, my one bit of advice is don't approach it too clinically. Don't just be like, okay, all I care about is getting down the street as quickly as possible, ticking off as many names as quickly as possible. It's a lovely opportunity to learn from people and debate them. And, and one of the positive aspects of Margaret Thatcher was she was famous for being prepared to stand on a doorstep for an hour arguing with Labour voters trying to win them over when her team was saying come on stop the conversation we got to get on this person's never going to get vote for you get on put the leaflet through the next door but I think you've got to have a bit of sincerity and belief in converting people on the doorstep over to you. Tony Blair used to tell this very funny story about um, canvassing in I think it was in Tower Hamlets and he's going, and this was at a time when Labour was committed to unilateral nuclear disarmament. So he goes up, knocks on the door, and he's given this woman a, a leaflet where Labour are committing to unilaterally disarming their nu- our nuclear weapons, a policy in which Tony Blair did not believe. Um, and so he's trying to persuade this woman of this and says, well, I'll tell you what I care about. What do you care about? I care about the rats. I've got rats in my council house. What are you going to do about the rats? And Tony goes back to try to persuade her about unilateral nuclear weapons. She says, is that how we're going to deal with my rats? These <laughs> so, so, and I think the, the, the lesson from that is go with the flow in the conversation. I think you're right about it. Sometimes it takes time. I, 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 I'm, I would not recommend spending an hour and work out very, very quickly whether it's a good use of your time. Yes, it's a good use of your time to hear what people are saying. But if somebody says to you straight out, I'm not voting for you, I wouldn't vote for you if you gave me 10 million pounds here and now, then I would just move on to the next one. So you are in the act of persuasion. I think the other the other advice I give is genuinely to listen and to feed and to feed back. If a, a good campaign does listen and it does it does sort of work out what a community as a whole is is trying to trying to say to you. But Rory, did I tell you about my Bob from Bakewell? I can't remember if I told you about Bob, yeah, from, on, Bakewell. Bob from Bakewell. Go on. So I got a wonderful email the other day. You will know this uh, about sometimes writing a book can be very, very, very lonely. And I got this email from a woman telling me about her husband who read my book about the need to get more politically active. The local Tory councillor stepped down whilst Bob from Bakewell was reading the book and he decided do you know what I need to get more involved I'm going to put my hand up for Labour he stood as the candidate and won the seat for Labour for the first time ever oh how's about that that's lovely well I think that's something to wrap on let's 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 finish with that we're looking for optimistic news turns out there are two things there People can get involved in politics, but also writing books can make a difference in the world. Well, that's uh, another question time. Come to an end. Enjoy the rest of your holiday. And good luck with the next book and inspiring more people to change their lives. <laughs> All the best. Bye-bye.